So the next speaker is Kurt Obsel. He's a guest from the United States. Um, and he's working, or he's not only working, he is the executive director and general counsel of the Electronic Frontier, Funda Frontier Foundation. And he is a long-term working attorney and he has had many high-profile cases against the National Security Agency, for example. And that's also his topic, I guess. Um, this talk's called it always feels like the five eyes are watching you, so give a nice warm welcome to Kurt, please. Thank you, thank you everybody. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be back here at CCC. Thank you all for coming. I know there's a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting things to do here, so thank you for taking some time out of your uh, CCC experience to come see this talk. Uh, today we're gonna talk about the five eyes. Uh, the five eyes are an intelligence alliance. It is a group of countries, intelligence services, who have agreed to work together, share data, uh, and it is the, uh, as far as we know at least, the largest uh, intelligence alliance uh, in the world. Uh, its members are Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Uh, each one of them, one of the eyes. Uh, and they share information about all sorts of intelligence. It's primarily uh, signals intelligence, but it also involves uh, human intelligence, uh, which is uh, you know, actually working with, with sources, uh, uh, like the more what the uh, spies do, and geospatial intelligence, which is like looking through satellite uh, information and trying to derive intelligence from that. Uh, the Five Eyes, uh, as we will as we'll see, it originated uh, in the Second World War. It continued on very strongly in the Cold War, uh, and it continues to this day still spying on all of us. So its members, uh, the United States, that uh, primarily the uh, National Security Agency, but also uh, that works with some of the other agencies like the CIA and the FBI. Uh, the United Kingdom as primarily the Government Communications Headquarters, or GCHQ, uh, as well as other uh, services, such as the uh, famed MI6 and uh, James Bond. The Australian Signals Directorate, which is their uh, signals and intelligence uh, uh, agency. Uh, and when it comes to some of these partners, they have uh, particular areas of the world that they're responsible. So, for example, Australia has responsibilities in the Pacific area. Uh, in this uh, uh, excerpt here, it is showing that it's Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, based on Australia's unique language capabilities and geographic access. So, uh, each of the members has certain responsibilities which may be exclusively theirs, and then they share the, uh, the information. Uh, Canada has the Communication Security Establishment, uh, which is also known as CSEC for the Communication Security Establishment Canada, and uh, the several other intelligence services. Uh, this, this excerpt shows some of the uh, depth of the cooperation. It talks about uh, exchange of officers, joint projects, shared activities. There's a strong uh, embedding within each other. And then uh, New Zealand, where it's the Government Communications Security Bureau, as well as some other intelligence agencies. Uh, in this excerpt, it is talking about uh, how, how keen they are to share data. Uh, they're uh, working to uh, meet the standards of that so they can get into the X key score. We're going to be talking a bit about the X key score later on. Uh, and it says, it's hoped that sharing will be achieved so we can offer full take collection data. Uh, full take is a way of describing the sort of a mass bulk surveillance kind of information which New Zealand is gathering and then uh, sharing with the other ones. So it started out, uh, as I said, in the Second World War where the US and the UK made several uh, intelligence agreements. Uh, in the 40s, uh, these intelligence agreements also worked with uh, several of the uh, uh, allies, Western European countries, uh, but then Post-war, it shrunk down to just the U.S., the U.K., and the key dominions at that, that time. They were dominions of the uh, United Kingdom, Canada, uh, New Zealand, and Australia. They've since become more independent. The term five eyes came from uh, just shortening. The, the formal way of saying it when describing the classification level was 
Australia, Canada, New Zealand, UK, US, eyes only. That was a bit of a mouthful. So that got shortened to the five eyes. Uh, and then they actually have an acronym, even shorter, F-V-E-Y, as a way of uh, uh, tightening it down a little bit more. So uh, the, the main document is what's called the UK-USA Agreement. Uh, so it was originally called the British-US Communications Intelligence Agreement, uh, but uh, the name was revised in 1955 to the UK-USA Agreement. Uh, and the US and UK are still the primary uh, bodies that are, are part of this. They are the first parties, while Canada, Australia, New Zealand are second parties. So they're uh, not full, but they are very close to being full within this, uh, within this agreement. Now, there have been many plans to uh, expand the number of eyes, some discussions of it. There have been various proposals to add a sixth country, to make it six eyes. Uh, France and Germany uh, reportedly were approached to uh, become part of it. There also are some wider groups which uh, uh, include, we had first party, second parties, now third parties. Uh, and so the Nine Eyes, some student documents revealed a group called the Nine Eyes, Denmark, Norway, the Netherlands, and France added into that as, as third parties. And then there's also a group called the SIGINT Seniors Europe, uh, which is more or less 14 eyes, because it takes the nine eyes and adds in Belgium, uh, I think I overdid France, I'm sorry about that. Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, and Sweden. And I may have missed one in there, but you can see that at the very bottom of, of the screen here, the full list of that. Um, now, the Five Eyes Agreement, for a long time, was an extraordinarily closely held secret. Uh, the UK-USA agreement, the very existence of it was secret until 2005, uh, and the text of the agreement was secret until 2010. Uh, it is now available, there's the, the URL if you want to go uh, uh, look it up and read some of the, the agreements and its accompanying appendices and a lot of documents that uh, uh, set it about. Uh, the agencies that were heavily involved that were themselves secret, the NSA, GCHQ, and CSEC, for example, were not publicly acknowledged until the, uh, the 70s and for a while even after they were, information about them was leaked. They were still denied. Uh, in the United States, the, uh, the joke was that the NSA was no such agency, uh, referring to the practice of denying its very existence. In one sort of interesting quirk, Australia, uh, the Prime Minister didn't find out that Australia was part of this group uh, until 1973, uh, when there was an uh, uh, internal uh, dispute in Australia, which led to some investigations into their intelligence services, and then they discovered that, in fact, there was this, uh, this agreement. Uh, but now the Five Eyes is a little bit more open about its uh, existence. Uh, they now have annual meetings and issue uh, press releases. During the Cold War, the Five Eyes focused primarily on the Soviet Union and China, which were considered to be the big threats, the communist threat of that era. Uh, and it was mostly extensive NSA-GCHQ cooperation. We see here in the pictures that's the GCU. GCHQ headquarters on top, the NSA headquarters on the bottom. Uh, and they used that in some key uh, moments of the Cold War, um, some Vietnam, the conflict there, um, in the CIA-backed coup in Iran uh, in the 50s, in the Chilean coup that brought Pinochet to power. Information derived from the Five Eyes collection were used to uh, effectuate those coups. Uh, one of the key programs uh, was for Signals and Tendrolet, the Echelon Collection and Analysis Program. Now, Echelon is actually just one of the code names for the program. It's the most well-known code name, so I'm referring to it there. Uh, but it had several names over the years, and uh, it started out in the 60s, and it was using uh, Earth stations to gather information from satellites, because at that time, for a lot of long distance uh, data and telephonic uh, communications were being beamed up to satellites, beamed back down to the Earth, and it was possible to receive the satellite signal, even if you weren't the intended recipient. Uh, and that was a primary source of communications intelligence. And so they uh, used the geographic coverage of the Five Eyes, plus their uh, technology and building down uh, receiving stations, 
to gather information throughout the world and bring it all together. Though over time, Echelon became more or less obsolete. Fiber optics began to supplant satellite communications, uh, and satellite communications, of course, still, still exist and are still used, but they're often being used for things like uh, video, uh, things which are, uh, uh, you get the idea of what you're trying to spy upon just from like, the metadata of knowing what video is being sent. You don't need as much of the raw data. And they were getting worried that they were getting very little intelligence uh, through these uh, downlinks, and they needed to get onto the uh, internet more where the fiber optics were carrying more and more of this data. Uh, and this really ramped up in the new millennium. After 9-11, uh, uh, there was a strong desire to expand in this capacity, pushing the limits of law and policy. Uh, and they wanted to live on the network to try and get back to the, the place where they had a deep insight into world communications. Uh, and a lot of the global IP traffic is being routed by cables that go through members of the Five Eyes. They were some of the more technologically uh, uh, quick to adopt the internet and had a lot of the cables going through the country as it was. Uh, and this allowed them to engage in some of the bulk collection. Two of the programs that have become well known through the uh, Snowden leaks, the upstream program from the NSA and the Tempora program from the GCHQ. So the, uh, uh, this is an example from the NSA's upstream program. Uh, this is, uh, it came from uh, EFF's lawsuit against the National Security Agency. We are now uh, in our 10th year of suing the NSA, uh, and they haven't successfully gotten rid of the case yet, which I think is a, somewhat of a, of a victory. Uh, and what we show here is the Folsom Street facility. Folsom Street is just a building in, in San Francisco, a windowless building that serves as a, uh, a routing and peering center for AT&T. In there, the information comes through, goes through an optical splitter. One copy goes on to its destination through the peering links. The other copy goes to a NSA controlled room and then to a secret network which goes back to the NSA uh, and similar designs with this sort of split optical splitter are uh, throughout the, uh, the network where they're getting this take from the global communications. Uh, Tempora uh, works in a, in a similar manner. The GCHQ refers to it as a buffer. So they have a buffer which they've taken from fiber optic cables going back a certain period of time. Um, and then they share that with the five eyes through X key score. Uh, you can see here from this excerpt that they're a massive amount of data. They're very proud that this is more data than several the other, all the other uh, databases combined. Uh, more than 40 billion pieces of content per day. So this gives you a sense of the scope of the surveillance that is being conducted and then uh, used in this. Uh, in addition to this bulk collection, the Five Eye members are involved in active collecting programs. They will develop and deploy malware, uh, develop uh, back doors to allow them access to put that malware on. They have tailored access operations, which is where they go after more specific targets, directly uh, trying to attack uh, a known person uh, or entity and then corporate access where they are obtaining information from the internet service providers, from the telephone service provider, the large internet companies uh, through, uh, famously there's the program Pr PRISM that came out through the Snowden leaks and they also will use, as they did with PRISM, secret warrants, other legal process to obtain information from the companies and put it into their shareable system. And in some cases when they weren't feeling like they were getting enough from the companies, they also took active measures. As one of the uh, Snowden documents uh, revealed, they found that uh, links between data centers uh, at Google were not being encrypted. And so they were able to get in between those links and get the data that was, as far as Google was concerned, inside their system, but was now accessible because the SSL was removed. 
Uh, so some examples of things that, that came through this cooperation, uh, there's the Reagan malware that was uh, allegedly made by GCHQ and NSA working together. Uh, this was found on Belgacom, a Belgian telecom provider, and also on EU official uh, computers. So this was being used by the Five Eye members to spy upon the European Union, see what was going on there. Uh, the Snowden uh, documents showed that the NSA was behind this, uh, this intrusion into the EU networks. Uh, another example, uh, Eternal Blue, and this kind of shows how some of these uh, uh, things can go wrong. This was an exploit, uh, exploit to uh, SMB that could uh, allow for remote code execution. Uh, and then uh, it was leaked by a group called the Shadow Brokers, who uh, somehow got a hold of uh, a variety of NSA tools and, and leaked them. It was eventually used by WannaCry uh, and caused a, a worldwide trouble there. Uh, and even though once it uh, was known to have leaked, their patch was out, it's still actually very dangerous because people are slow to patch. So this shows an example of how some of these tools where they're, you know, will tell you that it's designed to make the world more secure are in fact backfiring and can make things less secure. Another example of that, uh, Juniper, the uh, Juniper Screen OS used dual EC DRBG. Uh, this uh, was something that the NSA inserted a flaw into it, a flaw into its random number generator that uh, allowed someone who knew uh, what, what constants were being used to have an easier time to decrypt the ca uh, traffic going through the Juniper uh, iron that was using screen OS. Uh, though the funny thing about this one was that uh, when this was discovered, it ended up using different constants than the NSA had originally provided, which suggests that this back door that they had created uh, to allow easier access to uh, uh, communication streams was, had been compromised and put under the control or made easier for a third party, where the, basically the back door got out of their control. So a little bit about how the five eyes works. Well, uh, I mean, it's, it's more or less straightforward. They connect, they collect uh, intelligence, signal standard human intelligence. They share that with other members under the uh, five eye restriction. Uh, they make an agreement uh, not to spy on each other's government officials, uh, government entities, though uh, not so much uh, as far as each other's citizens. Uh, and the other uh, advantage of some of this, how it works, is that uh, if one part of the five eyes is engaged in a particular spying, the others can deny that they're doing that spying, because, you know, literally they are not, uh, and still get the data. Uh, and so a lot of the things that came out that later were shown to be part of Five Eye programs, uh, when they came out, there were some denials from members of the Five Eyes who weren't the ones who were part of that aspect of the collection. And very dangerously, it allows for some domestic workarounds where if you have the, uh, if you're a member of the Five Eyes, you may have, as all of them do, um, restrictions on when you can spy upon your own citizens. You might have to go to a court, uh, might have to get special process, might have to go through uh, a lot more uh, paperwork, uh, but that may not be true for the other members of the Five Eyes who might be able to spy on your citizens and then share the information back. So uh, David Blunkett, a former uh, Home Secretary of the UK, was talking uh, to, uh, to Parliament, and he said that the NSA were circumventing the UK restrictions, where the UK would have to go through this additional process if it was to ask for information about uh, UK citizens. But the NSA instead just offered to give them the information without the masking, and so that was somehow able to get around that, uh, that restriction. The other thing which is pretty key for the domestic workaround is this notion that unintentional collection uh, isn't a problem to share. And unintentional collection is this notion that they are intentionally collecting bulk data, in this case, talking about uh, metadata, but there's no intent to target an Australian national, this is one of the Australian ones, uh, because they're just collecting everybody, and it just so happens there might be some in there, but because it was unintentional, 
that is something that can be shared. And I think this is, a, this is a very dangerous notion. One of the core dangerous notions of bulk collection is that it doesn't matter unless you are specifically targeting. If you target everybody, you can get everyone, but you're doing it unintentionally and so it doesn't matter. And then once that data is obtained, it's very easy to share through the uh, X key uh, score system. They, the operators can determine what level of sharing is available on that. They could select, for some data, a five eyes defeat checkbox, select that box, and it will not be shared with other five members, but it's not required. Uh, and they can basically put on there a whatever selector they deem appropriate, and then it can be shared with those members. They're a little bit more selective for the third parties, the nine or 14 eyes that might be, uh, might be part of it, but there's a lot of sharing within the original five eyes. So to give an example of how the third parties can get some access, uh, Germany's BND uses X key score. Uh, in this uh, excerpt, they talk about successfully using some DSL wiretap collection, and also the uh, BFV, the uh, uh, German uh, Domestic Intelligence Service, uh, was looking for more uh, X key score access, uh, and the NSA seemed to be delighted to provide that. So they may not be getting everything, but there's a lot of cooperation trying to get this, uh, this data and share it. So to, to bring this sort of more towards what, where, where is this going today and where are the problems today, I want to take a deep dive on encryption, which is something that is a very important for the world. It provides privacy and security for billions of people. Uh, and that privacy and security is vital for the functioning of a democratic society. But the five eyes, they want to return the world to the days where it was easy for them to get massive spying on data. And so... Uh, they have a very keen interest in encryption. This is from the X key score, uh, sort of a promotional PDF that was leaked through the uh, Snowden documents. And they give the example of encryption. Well, you can just go to the X key score and say, hey, show me all the encrypted Word documents in Iran or all the PGP usage in Iran. And you could substitute any country for Iran in this, this example. So they want to be able to get that. Uh, they have a, a storage facility where they keep encrypted data for as long as it takes to uh, decrypt it. Uh, but encryption is getting increasingly frustrating for the Five Eyes. Uh, this is this just, just one example. Uh, HTBS in Chrome over the last couple of years from 2015 to 2018, where it's going from um, you know, a little below 50% uh, up to somewhere you know, in the uh, mid 80s. Different countries have different adoption rates, but the trend is there. And I think this example uh, is more or less reflective of overall trend. Things like Let's Encrypt have made it a lot easier to encrypt uh, uh, internet traffic. And so they're finding it more and more the communications that they're trying to spy upon are encrypted. And they're also finding it frustrating that the devices that they seize are often encrypted. So in 2017, the ministers of the Five Eyes met in Canada and in issued a joint communique. So as I said, they had previously been secret, but now they're a little bit more often. So they're, they, they're issuing this statement. And here it says they, they said, you know, Here's the problem, we're, uh, we're worried about encryption, uh, and we're committed to develop our engagement with communications and technology companies to explore shared solutions while upholding cybersecurity and individual rights. So this is part of their, their sort of their softer touch. They want to engage with the companies. But that softer touch had a little bit of uh, a force behind it, uh, which was the then recently passed UK Investigatory Powers Act. Uh, now, the, the act itself claims that it doesn't allow for uh, backdoors. It never certainly mentions the, the word uh, backdoors. Uh, but that's because it's so broad that they don't have to mention backdoors. Uh, it has extremely powerful warrants that can target people, target organizations. Uh, it has one particular feature, a technical capability notice, which is basically their approach to dealing with the encryption problem in a, in a nutshell, which is, they're saying, we don't want backdoors, we don't want to break encryption, we just want you to be able to provide the ability to disclose the content of communications in intelligible form. So encrypt it all you want, so long as you can give us plain text access whenever we ask for it. 
uh, which you know is sort of the opposite of what you're looking for uh, in encryption. And so, how would they how would they implement that? Well, we got a little bit of a clue earlier this year when uh, Ian Levy's GCHQ's uh, technical director proposed a solution uh, where it was called a ghost user to surveil encrypted uh, group chats. A ghost user is someone who joins the chat but is not revealed to the members of the chat. So if you're on Signal, for example, it would be you, know, you and the people that you're signaling with, and then an invisible user that would also be, be part of this communications. But in order for it to work, it has to suppress warning messages. It has to do something basically that would kill uh, the authentication system so that you would know who you were talking to and be able to see if there was somebody added, added to the chat. But this is sort of an example of, of the ideas that they are trying to propose where they're saying we are not breaking encryption because we're not like messing with the math anymore. Uh, but instead, we're doing something within the, uh, the authentication model. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, the Five Eyes met again in Australia and they, they uh, issued another joint statement uh, and had a lot, lot of discussions in this. Uh, a couple of these are, are, are notable. One is that government sh should not favor a particular technology, they say. Uh, and this is a lesson that the uh, Five Eyes learned from the first crypto wars of the 90s where uh, several ideas were proposed, uh, key escrow systems, the clipper chip, and then security researchers investigated them, found flaws, and they were turned out to be not very good systems. And so they decided to move away from proposing specific solutions that would be subject to that kind of review, attack, and then uh, ultimate disclosure that they weren't working, uh, and saying this is actually a problem for the providers to create these solutions. Uh, and then they up the ante again. This is the, the second paragraph there, and I want to put some emphasis. On, if you don't do this, if we continue to encounter impediments, we may pursue technological enforcement, legislative, or other measures. So previously they were saying, let's have some constructive engagement, but now they're saying, hey, that's some nice encryption there. Be shame if something happened to it. Uh, and this wasn't a, a idle uh, threat because at the same time in Australia, uh, they were working on a, a new piece of legislation. Now, Australia, is a little bit of a special place. During the debate about uh, uh, encryption in Australia, the Prime Minister said, well, the laws of mathematics, yeah, they're nice and all, but they don't apply in Australia. Only the law of Australia applies. And this, of course, is a response to various uh, security professionals being saying that it doesn't work. You, know, you, can't, you can't make a backdoor that isn't a backdoor. You can't make access to plain text uh, and still have a secure end-to-end -end system. But nevertheless, uh, Australia kept on going, and uh, earlier this month they passed the Assistance and Access Act, uh, which is a, uh, it's a complex law. It has uh, uh, many facets to it. I can hit some of the highlights here. Um, so one aspect is you know, similar to the, the uh, Investigatory Powers Act. It's like the Investigatory Powers Act plus plus. Uh, they have a, the secretly issue orders to compel companies to re-engineer software and hardware in order to comply with their, with their notices. Uh, it puts some hefty fines for corporations. The fines could go up to uh, 10 million Australian dollars. Uh, and for individuals, it could go up to 50,000 Australian dollars and potentially prison time for, for failing to comply. Uh, there's a pretty tough position, uh, a provision that seems to go against uh, uh, international norms on uh, freedom of expression uh, that suggests that counseling a technologist to, to oppose this, to, to not cooperate, could itself be a crime. And the fact that they, there's a, like some emphasis on individual technologies, a, a fine for them, also at least it creates the specter that the Australians may, if they're not getting sufficient cooperation from a company, approach individual engineers who are working for that company and try to get them to do something with a secret order. 
I'm not sure how that would be able to, to work very effectively in, in practice uh, for someone to be able to change the code without other people uh, knowing about it, but I think it's something that, that a lot of engineers are rightly, uh, rightly worried about. Um, so they also like, well, what, what is the scope of this? Well, it says the designated communications provider, don't worry about it, they must not be required to implement or build systemic weaknesses or systemic vulnerabilities. This was their, their nod to the criticism that they had received uh, that this might create uh, uh, weakening security. Uh, though you might be wondering, okay, well, what's a systemic weakness or systemic vulnerability? And that's a very good question because systemic is not defined. Uh, so we can sort of imagine that they're at least excluding uh, something that would affect a small number of people. Uh, but it's unclear whether their view of what is systemic is going to be the same as the computer scientists who have been working on encryption who are very worried about things as, that are systemic. For example, the ghost in the machine that the GCHQ had proposed, I would call a systemic weakness because it is systemically removing the security model for those communications, while they might say it's not systemic because we're just going to go in and monitor particular conversations, but not all of them. But we'll see what that ends up meaning. Also, it's limited to what they say is designated uh, communications providers, but this is very broadly defined as well, and they're trying to say that it is basically any company that has a nexus to Australia. Now, this may be, end up being uh, uh, more complex than that because uh, while a lot of companies do business in Australia, they don't necessarily have offices or engineers there. Uh, and a lot of the, the companies that they're sort of most concerned about are not in, uh, in Australia in every, in, in sort of a heavy way. Uh, so whether or not those companies sort of feel like they have to abide by this law, we shall see. Some, uh, uh, some projects, like open source projects, have said we're just going to not have anyone go to Australia anymore and we won't have to worry about that. But that's a harder thing to do for a company like uh, uh, Google or uh, Apple when they're trying to create their more secure messaging systems. Uh, and to give us sort of a, a sense of what they consider the types of assistance that, that they might ask for, uh, they have things like removing a form of electronic protection, that, that means cryptography, uh, if they have the capability of doing it. Uh, and so they're not also sort of, some, some discussions of this have said, if you have the keys, they're more about if you have the capability. Um, providing the design specs to the agency, uh, this is in case they want to create their own uh, attack mechanism or exploit on it. And that brings us to the next one, which is, installing, maintaining, testing, whatever, software given to the provider by the agency. So after they get that information, develop their, their exploit based on it, they might say, hey, here's this box, stick it on your network, don't worry about it. Um, or, you know, add this, uh, add this software so it can exploit on the uh, uh, target company's system. Um, and you know, they also have things like helping uh, tester develop their own systems and, and capacities. So trying to go sort of both sides of that, where they're putting obligations on the, the providers, as well as trying to help the agencies be able to break those things. Um, there's another one here, notifying agency of major changes to their systems that are relevant to the effective execution of a warrant. What that is talking about is if they are going to be adding something that adds more security. That if, if it's previously they were able to uh, get that information with a warrant, uh, but now it'll be less effective because an additional security system was put into place, they want advance notice about that so they can potentially do something about it. So for example, uh, on your iPhone, if you back up to the iCloud, then oftentimes there is a copy of your data where Apple has the key. Uh, and so if they seize your phone, want to get the encrypted information on there, and they can't get it from the phone, they can get the same information from the iCloud backup. But if Apple made it so that you held the key for your backup or a similar service came about, uh, then that would be perhaps one of these changes that they're looking for uh, notice of. And then uh, we'll just end on the, on the last one, 
concealing the fact that agencies have undertaken a covert operation. So secrecy is a big part of this, and so they will be doing these operations, potentially installing software, hardware on the networks, potentially uh, asking them to uh, remove things, but don't tell anybody about it. Now, many people have, have said to the, the uh, uh, Australians that uh, uh, this is not feasible, this is not uh, practical, that you're, uh, uh, you, know, you can't remove the, uh, the encryption without breaking it. Uh, so they have a provision here that the, uh, the Director General of Security, one of their top intelligence officials, uh, is not supposed to be issuing this unless uh, the uh, Director General is satisfied that it's practical and feasible. So that means sort of the decision-making authority on determining whether the complaints about its practicality and feasibility are true are the Australian government. So they could say, you know what, we disagree. We think it is practical and feasible. And so despite whatever arguments you have gone, the laws of mathematics don't apply here, only the law of Australia. So uh, go ahead and do it. So, why does, this, uh, why does this matter? Well, it matters for a lot of reasons. One is that the Five Eyes is conducting surveillance operations on a global scale. Uh, they are creating, with this bulk surveillance, something similar to the Panopticon. The Panopticon refers to a, a prison design where, uh, as seen here, the prison would be a circle around a central surveillance location. Uh, and that would mean that all the prisoners' cells could be viewed by the surveillance, and they wouldn't know whether their individual cells were being viewed. And the idea was to induce better behavior from the prisoners because they knew they could only, always be spied upon. They are always being subjected to, to surveillance. And that was designed to intimidate them into not doing bad behavior. Uh, and by creating a, a regime where all of our communications are capable of being spied upon, where there is no security that you can be sure of, that you can go to a company, get something which seems to be an end-to-end -end product, but know that they might have gotten a technical assistance notice that might have introduced a flaw to the system, like that ghost, that would be able to listen in, then you're subject to this panopticon where you're always knowing that Big Brother is watching you. The second thing is that this is not just for identified targets. You know, a lot of times, the, the rhetoric around this will talk about we're using this just to get sort of the bad guys, the terrorists and such, but they're still collecting all the data because essentially they're trying to create a time machine so that if later they find out that somebody is, is worthy of their attention, they don't just start surveilling them, but they can go back and say, well, wh wow, what was, their, what was their emails from five years ago? Uh, you know, what, what uh, uh, have they been searching uh, through their browser prior to when we became interested because they have that take? And, you know, the further back in time, perhaps, the less that it goes. But we've also seen things like uh, the NSA built a massive facility uh, in Utah uh, that can store you know, years and years of full take from telecommunications. Uh, so they'll be able to go back in time pretty far. And like, this is something which is fundamental to, go, goes against fundamental human rights. Privacy is a fundamental human right. Uh, it has been enshrined upon things like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, virtually every charter of human rights uh, identifies privacy as something that is important. Most constitutions will have provisions about it. And it's trying to strip away that privacy with the thin veneer of saying, well, but we won't look at the data until we think that there's a reason to, so you still have privacy. And that is, that is not right. And so it falls afoul of some key principles where that surveillance should be necessary and proportionate. She only conduct the surveillance when it is necessary, when there is a reason to it that allows you to target that person, that, that entity, 
uh, for an important state interest, but also it has to be proportionate. That the amount of surveillance, the type of surveillance, the activities should be proportionate to the threat that you're, you're mitigating. And I put up a link here to the necessary proportionate principles, uh, necessaryproportionate.org. These are some principles that were derived by a number of civil society members and NGOs to set forth uh, what would be a good way to balance between these very important human rights uh, and the investigative capacities of nation states. And it's very important if we're going to have a free society moving forward that the surveillance abides by these principles and it is disproportionate to do bulk surveillance. And one of the things I was saying is that why uh, encryption is particularly important is because they want to destroy encryption to allow for that bulk surveillance. That if, uh, if there's a particular target, they have plenty of tools for malware, tailored access operations to be able to do pretty well surveilling a particular person. But the encryption gets in the way of doing massive surveillance and storing all that VL, making it available through things like X key score so that they can go back in time. And that is the sort of the greatest danger to having a free society of the massive surveillance. Uh, and by doing this very publicly, it also normalizes mass surveillance. So that, you know, there, there's a, a line of rhetoric that's sometimes used that uh, because, you know, the Five Eyes are Western democracies, that, you know, they're the good guys and we shouldn't worry so much about misuse of these powers. But even if you buy into that, it normalizes mass surveillance for all the other countries in the world. So if you find a country that you would find authoritarian, uh, that uh, will not be respecting human rights principles, they can now say, hey, we're just doing what these other countries do. It is part of what every country does. And so breaking encryption, asking for the back doors, making sure that we can get access to plain text, for example, is something that all the countries can ask for. And if you, even if you feel that it's okay that Australia can get this information and then share it with the other 5i members or maybe the 14i's, maybe you don't feel so much that China should get this, that they should be able to say that all devices sold in China will have a backdoor that goes to the Chinese government, or maybe it's the Russian government that you're worried about. But in all these circumstances, it makes it too normal. Uh, and also, the, as we saw with some of the examples uh, some of the malware and such, that the weaknesses that have been introduced into the system by the, by the Five Eyes have been used by others. They've gotten outside of the control and that even if they feel like, well, it's not a systemic weakness, to use their, their term, uh, that it can become a systemic weakness when it is massively exploited. When it goes out through, perhaps it's the shadow brokers, perhaps it is just its independent discovery by a security researcher. We don't know all the ways they can come out, but we do know that weaknesses do become discovered and do become exploited. And so once you put them in, they can be abused. Uh, and then the Five Eyes offers no real protection for, for its allies. In fact, there have been examples of the Five Eyes spying on countries which would ordinarily be considered allies, members of NATO, for example. Uh, there's not very much uh, protections for ordinary Five Eyes civilians because they have that ability to spy and share the information with other members. And there's nothing for the rest of the world. that just They uh, have, have very little uh, in the way of restrictions on what can be done for everybody else. Uh, and so while security is so important, uh, a key thing, the problem is not that it's too strong. We already have enough weaknesses in our information security and finding more in order to enable the spying is going to be ultimately counterproductive. Now, in this way, the Five Eye, they say we're, we're all about security. They were trying to say, you know, we're trying to secure the world, uh, but they've actually introduced widespread insecurity. And the encryption example is very, uh, is sort of the, the, the key to this one because that is really where they're, at least in, in the public relations, having the, the method of attack right now. Uh, they want access on demand to encrypted air. And they're saying that this is what they call responsible encryption. But the only responsible encryption is strong encryption. And if you have access on demand, 
you've destroyed the trust in the end-to-end -end security model. You've made it so it's not possible to have a fully trustworthy system. And if you destroy that trust, that is a systemic weakness. So uh, a lot of the work has been done from uh, the Five Eyes Network trying to introduce into security researchers the notion that we should be continuing to have what they call the debate and try to figure out ways in which you can have your cake and eat it too, where you can have strong encryption but nevertheless get access. And they say, we need to research this. We need to discover it. Instead, what we need to do is find the weaknesses that already exist and try to fix them. So don't be seduced by the uh, temptation to try and find a better escrow system, a better way of providing that access, but instead we should fight for the strongest possible encryption so that we have secure communications and therefore we can have a democratic society. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Kurt. I think we have plenty of time left for some good questions, if we have them. So line up at all the microphones. And let's start with Signal Angels. I heard you have something for us. From the internet, can you comment on the use of arms export control regulations, in particular, uh, to prevent the spread of strong encryption? Uh, sure, so he's asking about the, the Vasnar arrangement, uh, which is a, uh, an arrangement uh, where they're trying to list out some uh, munitions that uh, cannot be exported, who have export controls. And, you know, f for many of you, munitions may bring to mind things like tanks and guns and such. But uh, in, in some cases, they're looking at for example, tools, pen testing tools, as falling under the sort of the category of things which should be uh, restricted. Uh, also strong in encryption devices. And I think this is, this is kind of a mistake, that it, it is not uh, really realizing that in order to test security, you have to use the tools that can break security, even if those might be tools that could be used for evil. So, a lot of the uh, controversy that's come up from, from Vasnar is that uh, uh, in a you know, well-intentioned uh, attempt to try to make it more difficult to sell uh, attack tools to repressive regimes, uh, but they also overdrew it so that it was uh, removing some tools that were necessary for security researchers. Okay, um, let's have microphone four, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your talk. That was uh, very informative. Um, my uh, question is, I mean, they've got the technology to do the surveillance. Do they also have the uh, ab ability to do some um, manipulation on the data? And are they actually performing those manipulations? Uh, so that's an, it's an interesting question. I, I don't have any uh, evidence that it has been done at any kind of scale. Um, but the ability, uh, certainly if you have a fiber optic cap, for example, uh, on a system, uh, as, as we understand how they do it, they just put an optical splitter, take two copies on their way. Uh, but it is certainly possible to have a more complex uh, computer system in, in its place that would look at some of the data and determine that some of it could be changed, should be changed. It may be too detectable. One of the things they're very worried about is being detected. Uh, so I'm not sure how that would work at scale without some lag for the particular information that was being stripped and, and, and moved. And we haven't seen any, any sort of documents about it being done at scale. Now moving back not at scale, uh, there certainly has been some information manipulation over the course of the you know, uh, uh, almost 100 or 80 or so years that the Five Eyes have been working together uh, with, with some of like, you know, uh, uh, during times of conflict, 
For example, we talked about the Vietnam conflict. The Gulf of Tonkin Institute was later revealed to have been a bit of a sham. Uh, so at a, a smaller scale, certainly it is in the history of these agencies to engage in, in disinformation. But I think, I'm not sure that that's applying to the massive scale. Well, let's have microphone one, please. Uh, yes, thank you for the depressing talk. Um, <laughs> Everything that you kind of summarized is essentially a legal attack. It's not a technological attack. Is you that, be a little bit closer to oh, the microphone? Sorry. Uh, everything Thank that you. you summarized is a legal attack. It's not a technological attack, really. Is there a place left that is traditionally a neutral jurisdiction, like, I don't know, Switzerland, some Nordic country, where at least you cannot be spied on without knowing it? or this battle is completely lost at this point? Well, so that, that is a good question. And uh, I, I think that, you know, there still is somewhat of an ability to base yourself in a particular country based on your knowledge of their laws and the restrictions they have on them, that country doing surveillance on, an, on its citizens. And you could sort of imagine a country that had sufficient transparency and control so you had a, a reasonable amount of faith in that. But the thing that you can't control for is whether they have been themselves compromised by a third party, for example, the Five Eyes. So you have, you know, uh, Switzerland, uh, and uh, uh, is it possible that the uh, Five Eyes have done surveillance on Switzerland without the Swiss permission? It's certainly possible. You know, I, I, I've not seen any information that that has happened, but a lot of really interesting stuff happens in Switzerland. And they're extremely interested in the flow of money. Switzerland is, is well known for its banking system and its secrecy. Uh, a little bit less secret than it used to be, but nevertheless, that, that's one of their, their, their principles. Uh, so that is a bit of the, the risk. So, I mean, think of it sort of like a, a, uh, a multi-prong thing that you need to have the law that says that you would be protected. You need to have a policy that makes that law actually effective, uh, the, the you know, country that abides by the, the rule of law. But you still need the third component, which is a technological protection, a system that you can trust that even if somebody was trying to actively exploit it, they would be resistant to that thing. So hoping that they don't because they have the law and policy, but also in case that they do, or maybe a third party does, that you have that system and to have confidence in that system. And I think those systems still will exist and they will continue to exist because uh, you can develop an open source product, make it available, not go to these countries, and someone can look through the code and, and have at least a reasonable idea that there's no intentional backdoor, there's no intentional ghost user capability, that it has a system where if anybody's added to a conversation, you need to verify keys and, and go through a process. So the technological step, I think you need in addition to being comfortable with the, uh, the, the nation state. Well, wow, that's a microphone too. Uh, hello. Um, so this is perhaps a little bit more of a comment, but um, so there's a thing in modern like messaging programs like Signal called a forward secure ratchet. And the, we think what it does is it allows the encryption to sort of heal if a device is compromised at a particular point in time. And what this is actually good for is, is it lets us simplify the authentication between devices. Um, so one interesting thing about this ghost user problem, so a major, a major sort of academic open question is, has been how, would you, how do you generalize these forward secure ratchets to, to multi-party things? And, uh, and we don't really have a great answer. There's some nice things, but the ghost user problem says that maybe the right way to think about this question isn't uh, how do we just generalize the forward secure ratchet with the healing property, but actually how do we make it specifically resistant to these ghost users? How do we make it so that it's mathematically impossible to hard to to hide who are the participants? So that and and this might be the right generalization for this kind of problem. Anyway, it's just an interesting thing I took away from your talk. Uh, well, okay, thank thank you for that that comment. Uh, so I'm going uh, to say as an initial response comment, and I'm. 
uh, an attorney, not a, not a technologist. So uh, I work with a lot of technologists. Uh, and so I, I couldn't tell you specifically about that, uh, that system, though it is to my knowledge that Signal is uh, working on trying to, to solve this, as, as some other end-to-end uh, -end, uh, 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 messaging providers are. Um, and that uh, uh, I would say as a sort of more of a, a higher level thing, as technologists, what y'all need to create, please hopefully the people in this room will, will do this, is a great user interface that simplifies the key authentication management transfer systems so that people can quickly and easily verify the, the keys of, of the other members of their uh, group. Uh, and make it so that uh, uh, it's very hard to add an unauthenticated, unverified person. Okay, let's hear from the internet again, Signal Angel. We have a few more questions from the chat. Um, the first one, how far do you believe SIGINT has come since the Snowden leaks? Do you believe it is far worse than in 2013? Yeah, that is another good question. Uh, I mean, so we, we have uh, uh, we had a great trove of information that came out in, in 2013 during the leaks, some of which actually was not, you know, right there at 2013, was describing things that were happening uh, a little bit earlier. There have been various follow-on stories, so we do know a few things uh, about you know, what has happened uh, uh, since. And there have been a few reactions, like in... in uh, in some places, the reaction has been to pass legislation to authorize more of these things, things like the Investigatory Powers Act and this assistance thing and uh, the uh, United States, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act had some modifications. So that really doesn't give you like a whole lot of faith. Uh, it gives more legal cover to some of the activities that they were doing. and. In the context of at least some of these laws, there were, there were various things that were put as a nod to the civil liberties concerns. Uh, that uh, we saw this you know, just now, where they're saying, well, we won't do systemic weaknesses. In some of the other bills, you know, there, there are things like, well, when you're presenting it to the court, the court can get experts, so it's harder for the, uh, the agencies to bamboozle the judges by uh, technobabble, you know, things like that. that are reforms, uh, <coughs> but it hasn't, I think, gone far enough to give us the confidence that there have been real reforms, and then there is sort of the concern at the same time that uh, their capabilities are increasing at an increasing uh, rate, like the ability to store data. If you think how much you know it costs to get like a terabyte uh, of data in 2013, how much it costs today, then sort of think about uh, how much traffic they can uh, cover by massive data storage, how many years back of full take they can store. Uh, and it's, it's going to be an ever-increasing number. It's going to be ever cheaper to store massive amounts of data that will allow them to go with their time machine further back in time. So, yeah, I am a little concerned with some of that uh, decrease in costs that that was actually one of the greatest protections we had for our civil liberties was it was too expensive to spy on everybody. You know, a long time ago, to find out where you are, they needed to uh, have a person walk behind you or like a car follow you around. And then they got like a beeper and they had to stick it on your car, but they still had to, you know, stick the beeper on and have somebody tracking it. But now we all have a phone in our pocket that gives out our location all the time. Uh, and so they could just query a database and find out uh, a, any particular phone numbers, movements. These are a lot of things which give them greater capacity. So I kind of think they're in the golden age of surveillance despite their claims of encryption causing them to go dark. Hmm. Uh, let's go to microphone one. You were there in the beginning. Hello. Um, what can you tell us about the position and role of the European Commission about all, all the decisions? Thank you. Of the UK or European Commission, AC. The EU or? Yes, they have. The UN or UK? The EU. Oh, EU. 
Um, so what can I say about the EU on this? Well, I think when, when some of these things came out, the EU did some uh, investigations into it uh, and has been generally saying that, that uh, this is a problem. Uh, for some of the, the they were reacting mostly to the, uh, the Snowden leaks. Uh, but then, you know, also a lot of the uh, data protection uh, efforts in the, uh, in the EU have been focused mostly on what information is available to uh, commercial entities. They do have some effect on government industry, but not a particularly strong uh, restriction against national security uses. So I think the EU could do more to make it clear that this would not be acceptable for, for EU uh, uh, members. So, I think we can squeeze on number four. Um, all right, so I was wondering about the access and uh, availability act, the Australian one you told us about. Um, from a legal or business perspective, uh, how eligible are companies actually for it and can they avoid it's by limiting or not doing any or actual business in Australia at all. And did some companies already sort of said they would want to? So I think uh, some of the companies came out uh, pretty strongly uh, against the, uh, the bill. Uh, as I recall, Apple uh, submitted uh, comments that were uh, pointing out some of the, the flaws in the, in the bill. Um, now, it's, uh, it's one thing to, to say that this is flawed and, and try to stop the bill. Uh, it's a little bit of a heavier thing to say, well, then we're just simply not going to do business uh, in that country. And that is, that is one of the, the challenges for any kind of global uh, corporate enterprise where they have to make some choices about whether or not they're going to do business in a regime that might assert jurisdiction and try to uh, make them do things that they don't want to do. And we've seen, you know, occasional examples of that. Um, after uh, Google discovered that China had hacked into its uh, systems and was uh, uh, getting information about some uh, dissidents through that, that hack, uh, they did stop doing uh, business in, in China for a while. But then uh, I think they're, they're still interested in potentially doing that uh, and working on a, a search engine that will be acceptable to the Chinese. Uh, so the, these, the, these marketplaces provide a strong temptation. Now, I, I think you know, Australia is uh, uh, not you know, the, the largest of, of markets. Uh, it's, it's one that uh, some of these companies could decide not to do business with without sacrificing a giant swath. Uh, but would they do that? It kind of will, will depend. Uh, they have to decide, okay, if we stop doing business here, uh, how much money would we lose? If we continue to do business here and we're forced to compromise our products worldwide in order to comply, how much business would we lose, especially if that ever got found out? Uh, and then the other possibility is say, okay, well, we're making a special you know, Australian version. Uh, and that, you know, that was, there's some bad history for that. Uh, for a long time uh, in, in the 90s, uh, there were two different versions of the then most popular browser, the Netscape uh, Navigator. One for uh, US domestic use, one for international. Uh, and the one for international had very weak encryption so that it was easy for uh, the uh, uh, NSA and, and Five Eye partners to be able to crack that encryption, but this was really silly because it was fairly trivial for someone to get a copy of the stronger encrypted version, uh, and ultimately, you know, that uh, that export control of the stronger encryption turned out to be uh, a, a violation of law, and so now we have everybody gets gets the stronger version, uh, and so I think you know if you if you try to say okay you know I've got this uh, messaging software and here's my Australian version, I think many people would be like maybe I shouldn't get the Australian version uh, if they think that this is the reason why they're having that uh, two products. Okay, so I think we have already overstepped our time, so I'm sorry for all the other questions, but I'm sure. They can find you, at least if it's not the internet. 
All right, so give another round of applause for Kurt, please. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming out. And thank you.